this has been an awesome day. Amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Can I get an hallelujah? hallelujah. Can I get a praise Jesus? praise Jesus? Can I get a water bottle? Thank you. These guys are on it. Man. Oh, I, I've been thinking about high school lately, and when I was in high school, I got the nickname Superfan. I would go to the basketball games, the football games, the volleyball games, and I'd wear a, a jersey and a rainbow wig. I'd run around with a flag, and uh, I was just cheering on my team, che cheering on my classmates, and getting the, the crowd excited, and it was so much fun. I, I went to buy some poster boards one time, and I found out that a dry erase board is not that much more expensive than a handful of poster boards. And then I could use that forever and keep changing it. So I bought this dry erase board, go to the games, write messages on it, things to encourage the players, things to get the crowd cheering, things like that. And we had this basketball game, and it was against the best team around. And they had a player that was really the best player in the state, Luke Recker. And I remember thinking, this, this is my game. This is my time to shine. And I'm out there with my board, and I notice Luke Recker's sagging his pants a little bit. And all the college, like, coaches and stuff were here to scout him at this, at this game. And so I write on my board, hey, Recker, pull up your pants. And he kind of glances over and ignores it. And a little bit later, I notice him pulling up his pants. He's like, I'm getting in his head. So I was like, hey, Recker, do this, do that. And he would do it. Eventually, I was like, hey, Wrecker, pick your nose. He ignores it, and pretty much later, he starts playing with his nose a little bit. I was like, this is awesome. End of the game. There was no way that we were going to beat them. Guess what? They beat us. But I'd like to think that my efforts made it a little bit closer. So... If I wasn't writing something encouraging or writing the local news affiliates initials on there trying to get on the news, sometimes I would write on the board John 3.16. I mean, I was into my faith. It wasn't necessarily to evangelize. I wasn't really that kind of a kid. It was more just for the comedy aspect because a guy with a rainbow wig holding a sign that says John 3.16 just seems a little bit cliche, and I thought it was kind of funny. And I was thinking about that. John 3.16 is probably the most popular verse in the Bible. It's held up at sporting events. It's recited all over the place. People are posting it on social media. And I'm just kind of curious if we do a little experiment and see if on the count of three, if anybody in here that thinks that they know the verse John 3.16, we'll recite it together. I won't do it in the microphone. This could be a disaster, but I'm just curious to see what happens. So I'll give you a hint. It starts with, for God, all right? So on the count of three, I want you to say it as loud as you can if you know it. One, two, three. Okay, okay, here's what happened. Here's what happened. You guys knew it and you said it, but there's different translations, so it kind of got fumbled up in the middle just because of the translations issues. But yeah, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. You've probably heard that before. Some of you have heard that many times before. Some of you have it memorized. And I think sometimes with these Bible verses that we grow up with, we might not realize what they mean because we grew up with them. It's kind of like something that we take for granted. And we might not realize the power in this message that kind of gives us a great little summary of salvation history. A, a salvation, the New Testament, the Bible, and, and Jesus' role that he played. And it's kind of like, you know, Sister Miriam is always quoting pop songs. And so I thought maybe I would quote one of my own. My son always wants me to sing this song, Itsy Bitsy Spider. Okay, maybe not quite as relevant, but Itsy Bitsy Spider, and I'm singing this. I think he likes the hand motions, you know, down comes the rain and everything, and so I, one day I was singing this song to him, and it was like the first time I ever thought about the words, 
So the itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. That was a big achievement for this little tiny spider. Let's give it up for the little spider, right? Down comes the rain, washes the spider out. This just got tragic. This is like a flood of biblical proportions. He was probably fighting for his life as the water just poured over him, gasping for every last little spider breath so he could survive as he's going down, down the water spout that he just worked so hard to climb up, only to be splattered out onto the ground, exhausted, back where he started. But then, out comes the sun. Dries up all the rain. It's a story of hope, of new beginnings. And this spider, you know what? He doesn't give up. He went back up the spot again. Yeah. I was like, I love this song. I love this story. It's a, it's a story of not giving up, of continuing this quest for going up the water spout. The spider that doesn't take falling down as failure, but an opportunity to try again. My whole life, I've sang that song, and I never thought about what it actually means. And I think some of these times, we can grow up with some of these verses, and like, oh, yeah, 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 for God to love the world, they gave us a little son, they didn't love And we don't think about what that actually means. What does it mean that God loves the world? I love the world. I love you guys. But, hang on, hang on. <laughs> Just wait. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. Never mind. Not into that kind of love. You see, I've got three boys, and if I only had one, it didn't matter. If I had three, I'm not giving up one of them so that you can have eternal life. What's your name? Nathan. Nathan, great guy. But if somebody comes up to me and says, you know what, uh, we just kind of crunched the numbers and it looks like for Nathan to have eternal life, you have to sacrifice one of your sons. I, it's just the way it's going to be. I'm like, Sorry, Nathan. <laughs> Better luck next time. I don't believe in reincarnation. I was, it's just that figure of speech. But I'm not going to sacrifice my son for the world. But that analogy of God sacrificing his son for us is a little bit broken because in actuality, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit are all part of the Trinity. They're all one God. So by God sacrificing Jesus, it's really God sacrificing himself. It might be a little confusing. But he's sacrificing himself for us, his children. We are all children of God. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. And God sacrificing himself for his child, that I understand. When, uh, when our youngest son, he's three now, he's great, he's happy, he's healthy, he's so fun. He's just a fun kid. But when he was about a month old, he started getting sick. And one thing led to another. One doctor's visit after a specialist. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. We ended up several times, I'm driving as fast as my minivan will allow to get us to the hospital in the middle of the night because we can't figure out what's wrong with this kid. And we spent about a month in a hospital. And over that course of time, he's not able to eat at different points of time. He goes into a surgery, gets an infection. They have to open him up, another surgery, that doesn't work. Open him up again, another surgery. This entire time, every time they do a surgery, they can't feed him before the surgery. And so he's malnourished. He's starving. He's getting stabbed by more needles than I will ever experience in my lifetime, probably most of us. And he's this little baby. 
and he's fighting for his life. He's so exhausted that he can't cry. He's just laying there. And I remember thinking that I would do anything to trade places. That I would gladly take on 10 times the pain, 100 times the pain, if I could just trade places with him so he wouldn't have to suffer. But I couldn't. That wasn't an option. They don't ask you, hey, do you want to have the surgery or do you want the baby to have the surgery? I couldn't trade places with him. You guys, Chris was very complimentary. I'm, I'm an okay dad, maybe even a good one. I'm not great. I'm far from perfect. I just went to confession earlier today because things that I've said and done. But I would do anything for my kids. So I get it. I understand a God that would do anything for us. I understand a God who sees us as children and would do anything to take our place. You see, we mess up. We sin. We sin against an eternal God. And he will forgive us. But there's still a consequence to our sin. If I break John Paul's guitar, I can apologize for it, and he might forgive me. But there's still a broken guitar that either I have to pay for, or John Paul has to pay for, or the conference has to pay for, right? There's still a price to be paid. And so God will forgive us of our sins, but there's still a debt, a debt to an eternal, infinite, all-powerful, all-loving, all-merciful perfectly just God. And so, instead of us having to deal with that, instead of us having to suffer the consequences of our sin, God says, I'll, I'll take it on. Where I'm not able to trade places with my son, God is all powerful. He can trade places with us. He can do whatever he wants. And so he takes our place. You know, our, our theme for the weekend is 1 John 4.19. But earlier in that chapter, 1 John 4, verse 8, says God is love. God is love. It's the same thing. Love is God. They are equal. If we experience love, we're experiencing God. And if we experience God, it is love. John 15, 13. No greater love has somebody than to lay down his life for a friend. There's no greater love than to lay down your life for another. So God, who is love, does the greatest form of love possible to lay down his life for us. He shows us the epitome of love, the definition, the 100%, this is perfection, this is perfect love. He shows us that by sacrificing himself, by Jesus going through the pain of the torture that happens before the crucifixion, which leaves him just inches from death. Like the maximum amount of torture that he could endure before dying, they just stopped just short of that so he can just sit in that moment and suffer before being crucified. This excruciating pain. I can't even imagine. He showed us the greatest form of love so that we don't have to suffer that, but that we could have life. I want to kind of look at these two verses side by side. 
1 John 4.19, theme of the weekend. In this way, the love of God was revealed to us. God sent his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. And John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but might have eternal life. So what happens? God reveals love. The love of God was revealed to us because God so loved the world. I have those highlighted on the next slide. He reveals his love to us. Why? So that we can have life. We might have life through him. What kind of life? Eternal life. He loves the world. So he sends his son. That's the how. He reveals his love to us so that we can have life. How? By sending his son. And he gives his only son to us. He gives everything so that we can have eternal life. But there's a catch. There's one little thing in that John 3, 16, that everyone who believes in him. Sounds simple enough. God suffers on a cross. Think about that for a second. So when God becomes man and suffers, love suffered and redeems suffering so that when we suffer, God is with us, that God is alongside of us and that we can unite our sufferings to the sufferings of Christ, that we can actually, he actually lets us, this is a weird thing to think about, he lets us participate in that suffering, that our sufferings wouldn't be in vain, that any sacrifice that we have to make, that any suffering that is caused by another person or by nature is not in vain because we can unite that to Christ's sufferings. People say offer it up, and it's like a Catholic cliche, right? But it's true. We can offer our sufferings up and be united. We get to participate in the salvation of that the suffering of the cross brings us. But it doesn't end with that because there's a resurrection. So Jesus' death actually conquers death through his resurrection, conquers sin, and so that our suffering now has meaning. God gave suffering meaning. Suffering is a hard thing for people to deal with, hard for people to reconcile with faith. But there is an opportunity in suffering. The suffering that I went through with my son and that my family went through, and that my son went through, is not something I would wish on anyone. Unfortunately, a lot of you have been through that kind of suffering. Unfortunately, some of you have been through worse suffering. That's not something I wish upon anyone. But in that suffering, I was able to and had to depend on God and rely on God. And through that, I believe that my faith got stronger, that my wife's faith got stronger, and a lot of our family, their faith got stronger. Because we had to depend on God, that we had to trust on God, and we knew that God was there helping us through it. Now, had we not had the faith that we had, it could go the other way. Sometimes suffering can pull families apart. But if we realize that God is with us in that moment, that God will help us through, regardless of the outcome, positive or negative, that God is still with us, and he can bring good out of suffering. He doesn't want you to suffer. That's part of, of nature. It's part of our fallen world that we, we have suffering. But he can bring good out of that. 
And even just the glimpse that I had in that moment of how much God must love me, how much I love my kids as a flawed, sinful dad pales in comparison to the love of God the Father has for you. I will never be able to love my children the way that God loves you. So I got a glimpse of that love. And in this moment, we can look at the cross and we can see this example of love. We can see a God who would come to earth to die for our sins, who would go through the humiliation and to be honest, you know, like, the teasing that he had is probably greater than any humiliation that we will ever have. And that was just the beginning of it. You know, if somebody makes fun of you for your faith at school, somebody teases you, that, that like, pales in comparison to the, the humiliation that Christ had to endure. And then the torture and the crucifixion and God's saying, I'm doing this for you so that you may have eternal life because I love you so much. I want to spend eternity with you. And remember the catch for those who believe. If we, if we reject God, he will respect that decision. If we ignore God, then that's the choice we've made. But if we believe in God, then we have an opportunity. One for eternal life. And it's not just a one-time decision. It's a decision that we have to make constantly. And a decision that will, frankly, make the wrong decision a lot of times. And we have confession for that. But having faith in God is a life-changing experience. It doesn't mean that we have all the answers. It doesn't mean that we fully understand God, that we fully understand suffering, that we fully understand what it means to love. But having faith in God is, is a leap. It's a leap of faith to say, God, I trust in you, and I put my faith in you. And for everyone here tonight, I hope that yesterday and today has been an opportunity for you to say, you know what? Wherever you are in your faith journey, maybe you're ready to take the next step. And to say, God, you love me so much. I, 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 want, I want to... Return that love. I do believe in you. And I want to live my life for you. And I want to spend eternity with you. So if you'll pray with me in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we come to you different places in our faith journey. We come to you hurting we come to you confused. We come to you skeptical. We come to you looking for something, sometimes not knowing exactly what we're looking for, but knowing that there's, there's something missing in our life. And Lord, you're the only one that can fill the ache that's in our hearts. So, Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts tonight to be open, just that we leave an opening for you to come in. In our brokenness, in our confusion, in our messiness, in our sin, that you love us, 
more than we will ever understand in this lifetime. Lord, help us to love you in return. Help us to have faith in you where there's doubt. And help us to believe that we have the opportunity to spend eternity with you. And give us the strength to step out in faith.